Um, so we're going to talk about slab pots. Um, slab pots are basically just made out of flat rolled out pieces of clay. Um, I have some examples I'll show you as we talk through some of this stuff. Um, just remember that you're working from your choice board. So your choice of themes for your slab pot are going to be to make a treasure chest. Um, you can make any sort of building, um, a functional pot, so something that actually is going to serve a physical purpose. You can do a non-traditional shape, so something really funky and weird. Um, you can pick robotic um, or a house. Houses are really a popular option. I have my notes here. <clears throat> okay, so, you know, just as always, first thing I need, once you've made all your decisions, that is, so reminder, you're going to um, pick your theme if you're doing slab pots. Um, we just went through those. You're going to come up with your five sketches. You're going to have two video resources. Now, when we talk about the video resources, um, that might be you're watching someone's building technique, or maybe you need a refresher on wedging. Maybe you want to focus on textural things. So you're looking at videos of people making different sort of textures that you could apply to your slab pot. I mean, it doesn't necessarily need to be someone building a slab pot. That's not always gonna be an applicable video for you. All right, clay. Um, so once you have your project idea, theme, you've had your conference with me with your sketches and your videos, um, don't forget to submit those on Google Classroom. You'll receive points. The next thing is gonna to be to wedge your clay. I always wedge standing up. Um, I am going to put two hands on either side of my clay. I'm always kind of squeezing. Remember you push and rotate down with the heel of your hand and then you use your fingertips to rotate that back. And I'm always rotating so that I'm wedging the entire piece of clay, not just one spot. Find your sweet spot, we've practiced. Mine's about, you know, 20 to 30 times when I stop seeing air bubbles on the surface. The goal is when you're wedging to keep your clay compact. Um, you don't want it to grow really long. Once you're confident in your wedging, the next step for slab pots is going to be to roll out my clay. Um, anytime I'm rolling or pressing something into the table, I always am very conscious to have a barrier because your table is smooth and your clay is wet and they will stick, they become best friends. Um, anytime I'm rolling slab that I know I'm gonna build with, I always use dowels. Um, there's a variety of sizes. Make sure you grab two that are the same. You're gonna lay one on either side using a rolling pin. You're gonna roll. If I start with a big piece of clay like this, I'm gonna struggle because I'm gonna have to put a lot of pressure on this thing for it to get this flat. So I like to help myself out, give it a pre-squish, be conscious, you're in a classroom with other kids. You don't need to be slamming this on the table to flatten it. Just use your hands, give her a quick go. Your clay is gonna grow in the direction that you roll. So if you need a big piece, you're gonna have to rotate as you roll it. Um, I'm starting with a wider piece, so as I roll, it's gonna grow longer. I'm gonna stand. I always use pressure with my hands um, on my clay like this, rather than grabbing on, because I rack my knuckles and then the width of my finger is preventing my slab from being pulled further. Um, oopsies, spilling all my water. Actually, you're gonna roll until your clay doesn't roll anymore. And then, you know, depending on what it is you're building, um, you may decide to roll all of your pieces at once because the thing about slab pots building with slab is the consistency of your clay is really important um in order to get your clay and i'm gonna stop here i'm just gonna cut this piece off in order to um build high enough for some cases you're gonna need stiffer clay even though clay has kind of like its own little memory, it likes to do and stay in the position that you have left it in. Um, soft clay is not going to stand on its own. It's just gonna buckle under that. Um, number one, weight. Number two, gravity's working against you. You don't need to continue to work 
um, on a bag, you can take it to the table after you've rolled. Then your next step is gonna be to cut all your pieces. Um, I am not a cut as I go person. I am a cut all my pieces, work on them, and then assemble later. Um, generally for this, I would say you guys are probably gonna be working medium to large rather than small. I'm not gonna give you a size requirement. So I would cut all my pieces. Um, I'm just gonna freehand this for you. Um, use rulers, templates, measurements. Make this about... So say I'm going to build my walls up. You have a choice. You can either build next to or on top of. My preference is always personally going to be building on top of because then I have access to all of those connections. Um, I find that if I build to the side where I'm looking at that bottom gap, you almost always forget to go back and smooth that back together. And that's always gonna be a weak point um, if you don't address those gaps. So building on top of is always my personal preference, but you do need to be mindful that um, my clay is probably close to a quarter of an inch thick. I have four sides. That means I'm gonna lose half an inch in both dimensions, width and length. I'm losing interior space. That might mean you need to either start bigger from the beginning, knowing you're shrinking a little bit, um, or maybe you're okay with that smaller interior. And then just a few reminders as you're building, you're going to score the surface in at least two directions. Um, small plane tool works just fine. I've scored that surface. I also need to score the base of the slab where I'm going to be attaching. So you score both parts. Slip is just clay um, with a lot of water in it. So I'm a finger or a dipper. I don't necessarily need to use tools because I am a little lazy and don't want to clean them when I'm done. So sticking them together. So this is where you're going to know, notice, um, I'm going to struggle because my clay is soft and until that slip has a chance to harden, um, if I'm working larger, I'm probably not going to achieve that vertical standing simply because weight and gravity. Um, so it's some things that you can do to combat that. One moment. Okay, um, so option number one to control the consistency of your clay is um, to make all your pieces and then overnight, rather than storing them with a paper towel, you can omit the paper towel, leave it out, and then you're not adding any moisture, you're just kind of letting your clay meet that same moisture point. So that's option number one is just avoid the paper towel and leave it out on the table as much as possible during class while you're working. Option number two, which is probably a little bit more control, um, is just using a hair dryer. So a hair dryer, use it on high, use it on hot, um, it is going to take the moisture out fairly quickly. I mean, you might be there for a couple minutes, but nothing too bad. Um, and again, you probably have the most control there. And then option number three would be a heat gun. We have three of them in the classroom. Um, find them where their electricity is. Um, part of that though, that you need to be conscious of is heat guns are very hot, much, much hotter than a hair dryer. So you're gonna run into potentially over drying. Um, if your clay dries too quick, you're gonna have cracks. It's not as bad when you're working with slab as it would be potentially with other projects. Just be mindful, watch the surface and continuously move. You don't ever wanna hover in one spot when you're using a heat gun. You wanna you know, fill the whole surface kind of like a fan back and forth. And then I always flip it over because the part that's touching the table is gonna stay moist and this part that I'm heat gunning is going to lose moisture and dry. You want that to happen evenly, again, to help avoid cracking and breaking, especially as it dries for the final dry process. Um, so flip it over, heat gun again, slowly over the whole surface. You might need to do that two or three times to achieve the stiffness that you're looking for. I say leather hard is good. Um, so when my clay is hard enough that it doesn't necessarily wiggle under my touch, but also soft enough that I can still carve into it. Um, some things when you're building, I like to take some soft clay. So clay in a pinch, I'll just add in a little bit of slip to this to moisten it. More moisture equals softer clay, less moisture equals harder clay. In this area here, 
where I have them connected is kind of a yucky connection. I would need to clean that up anyways, but if I just take some soft clay, roll a rough coil, apply it to where that crack is or that separation, and then just smooth it into both parts. So I'm gonna use my finger to push some of that nice soft clay down into the bottom and also scoop some up into the sidewall. Remember, generally when you're doing things like this, they get messier before they get neat. Okay, so clean that area up. And then to finish that job off, I might take a wet sponge. I might need to go back with my finger. If I like that tight corner and I don't want it to be kind of like a loose U, then I can take a tool, maybe a rib, or a smoothing tool with a, with a flat top and reintroduce that separation or that hard angle. Um, let's see, what else? Um, okay, so as you're decorating, so right, you've picked your theme. Let's say my theme is a house. Houses have lots of details. They have shingles to consider, windows, doors. Um, do you have an attic? Is there a yard? Lots of details, lots of textural moment options. In my opinion, it is easier to decorate flat than it is once I get it all built and to try to draw on the sides or the roof of my pot. So I tend to roll my slabs, get them the right consistency, then do my decorating. Let's say I'm gonna do shingles. I might do shingles kind of like this. just with the back side of a loop tool, the square side, and I just pressed it in. I do need to address if those parts are raised, if they're gonna be sharp like burrs after they're fired, then I need to smooth them down just gently with my finger. I can go back with a sponge and just gently press them down, right? And then once I have all my pieces cut, once I have all my pieces textured, it's a matter of assembling. When you're assembling, sometimes you're gonna run into this yucky corner situation here. Again, same concept to solve the problem. Add a little coil of soft clay. Sometimes if you have thicker slip, you can just take that slip and fill that gap, but you definitely wanna be physically reattaching that clay. If I just brush slip over it, like that nice soft stuff with a paintbrush, it'll temporarily fill that crack, but they're different consistencies. So as it dries, that crack is gonna show back up. So soft clay is always gonna be a better option than wet slip, okay? And then it's a matter of letting it dry out once you finish. So um, making sure you're keeping it bagged for at least four days and go through that four day dry out process we talk about. Day one is just a bag, no paper towel. Day two, open the bag up a little bit. Day three, nice big tent, big old tent, lots and lots of air. And then day four, you can fully uncover it. That is not an end all be all system. Now that you're in an advanced class, you're gonna have to make those decisions for yourself. If you're finding that your clay day to day is drying too much and cracking, you need to slow down that process. It is okay to let your clay live in any one of those stages for more than a day. A day is bare minimum. I say two to three days in any one stage, especially if you're working larger, is gonna be definitely a safer option. Let's look at some examples. Okay. <clears throat> so I showed you my little gingerbread house here. Um, keeping in mind, if you are building a house or building, um, does it have an environment? Does it need a yard? Is it on a street? If you choose to build a pot that has a removable lid, something you need to consider is you need a coil or a slab or something on the bottom to help these prevent when they're glazed, that glazed surface is really slick and these are going to want to slide. You don't want that. So you need to have a barrier under there that lives inside, down inside, inside of your pot. You get a nice flush, tight connection. Um, and then there's gonna be some wiggle, but it's not gonna, you're not gonna lose it as you're carrying it. And then take into consideration if you do have a lid, does it have a handle? And is that handle functional? That handle might not be a physical handle, it might be a lift hole, it might create a hole that you just, Stick your finger in and lift. A lid is not a requirement. SpongeBob here, lots of texture. As I run my hand over his uh, spongy self, I'm not feeling any of those sharp burrs. Um, he's a container on the inside. Nice detail, fully thought out. 
all the way around. Is it super important that he doesn't have legs? I don't know, it doesn't bother me. Those are things you're gonna need to consider as you're making your choices. And what you're building, um, leaving voids or holes is always gonna be acceptable, right? Especially like, let's say I'm gonna turn my slab pot into something functional and I wanna make it a candle holder. Great, great option, or a Scentsy pot, awesome. Probably gonna have to have some sort of vent hole so that your candle doesn't blow out. But let's think all the way through the process to the finish. Um, what does the inside of mine look like? So if it's something that's gonna not have a removable lid, I need to address the smoothness of the inside as I'm building so that I don't see those imperfections. And then number two is how do I make sure that's glazed? Um, because this is a very difficult surface to glaze inside of there. If I were this person, I probably would have watered down some glaze, poured it in, sloshed it all around, wiped off the outside access, and then went to glaze my outside. So just some things to consider. Slab pots, so again, requirements. Um, it needs to be a vessel of some kind, so it's gonna contain or hold something. That doesn't mean it can't have holes, it absolutely can have holes or voids. Um, it needs to have a theme, and then obviously it needs to be decorated with physical appropriate um, textures and things to your theme. Um, I'm not going to put fish on the side of a house. I might make a cabin and have a little fish sign that says welcome, but you're not gonna put fish scales on the side of a house. So just make sure that those things are appropriate as you, as you work your way through. Um, I wanna also remind you, this is an advanced class. So take time to neaten. Um, make sure that you're putting effort and energy into your projects um, and make sure that they're, you know, high quality. I mean, these are things that are gonna last you a lifetime.